The fleet sets off again. They stop briefly in Jamaica to replenish supplies, then sail west along the coast of Cuba. Beyond that, they will be in totally uncharted waters. No European has been beyond here before. Columbus fears his crew may become restless. They've been refused a landing at the only Spanish settlement in the Caribbean, and there's no end to their voyage in sight. Ahead lie the fears of the open sea. But Columbus has a trick, started on his first voyage, to restore the morale of his crew. He describes it in his log. To sustain their hope and dispel their fears of a long voyage, I decided to record shorter journeys than we actually made. I did this so that they might not think themselves so great a distance from Spain as they really were. For myself, I will keep a confidential, accurate reckoning. But, once again, Columbus shows his misjudgment as a leader. Tricking the sailors is only a short-term answer. Although the crew have no real idea of where they are headed, Columbus is still able to estimate his position at sea through a well-used navigational method. Well, Columbus used something called dead reckoning. It's rather crude, but quite effective. And that involved measuring time using a, a simple device like this, an hourglass that was calibrated for half-hour intervals. Secondly, he had a compass that worked out the direction in which he was sailing. And thirdly, he worked out the speed at which the ship was sailing by counting the time that some object would float from the bow to the stern. And taking that information together, he would plot it on a simple board like this that would enable them to actually measure the course of the boat and from that information he got a rough idea of where he was life on board follows a strict but relentlessly monotonous routine time is divided into systems of watches lasting four hours each every sailor is allocated a particular duty scrubbing the deck cooking meals keeping a lookout marking the hours and maintaining the ship But over four and a half thousand miles from home, and often far from the sight of land, their only real comfort is religion. The hope that a higher power would safeguard their lives. Conditions on board these tiny ships are extremely cramped and very unsanitary. People didn't think bathing was a good thing to do. So just start there, you know, and kind of work backwards. So the men slept on deck, they had their own sleeping mat. You know, you, you go back to the bathing thing too. A large part of the ship's diet was, was things like garlic and the salted beef and wine and olives. Sanitary conditions being what they were, it must have been a very odiferous crew. Going to the toilet was not very easy either. You basically went over the side uh, with it all hanging out. And it's uh, a very uncomfortable and uh, not very uh, dignified way to do it. But Columbus is a man possessed, and the condition of his crew is now inconsequential to him. He is determined to find the westward passage to the Orient at any cost. He believes that he had been very close to finding it before. On his first three voyages, Columbus discovered most of the islands of the Caribbean. Now, on his fourth voyage, he still believes that all these islands form part of Asia. He's still stacking up the evidence gained on his earlier journeys. All throughout his voyages, Columbus was looking for animals and plants that somehow would confirm this idea that he had reached China. Every bird, every plant, every pepper, every spice, everything that he found that even remotely resembled something Asiatic was to Columbus brilliant confirmation that he was in fact right and had indeed reached East Asia. Columbus's great goal on the fourth voyage is to find the mainland of Asia. Find what he thinks will be Japan and China and India. Seeking a way through, he sails down the Central American coast. He is the first European in history to map this territory. 
Along his way, Columbus has met many Indians who have told him tales of a place called Sigare and a vast inland waterway. They also say Sigare is surrounded by water and the 10 days journey away is the river Ganges. To Columbus, this sounds like the westward passage he has always believed in, a secret channel which bridges the oceans and will carry him to the Indies. In October 1502, Columbus stops at a place called Chiriqui, in what we now know as Panama. He follows an inland waterway which he believes will take him to the Indian Ocean. Columbus is about to discover whether his theory about the westward passage is right. But the vast waterway comes to an abrupt end. It is just another one of the many huge lagoons common on the Central American coast. You can be tricked fairly easy by these lagoons because they are so immense, so big, and you can't see the horizon, and you just think it's part of the ocean. And also the waterways that go inland, you think they're just like huge channels, so he was tricked quite often. But the Indians of Chiriqui offer an important clue. They refer to an overland route to a different ocean, a journey which takes nine days' march across the mountains. If Columbus takes this route, he will become the first European to reach the Pacific Ocean by traveling west. Standing virtually on the spot where the Panama Canal will be built three and a half centuries later, Columbus refuses to take the path. He remains convinced that he can still find a sea route to Asia. And he thinks that his crews won't survive a dangerous expedition across unknown lands. But this is the closest Columbus will ever come to solving the riddle of the westward passage. And his refusal is condemning his men to an indefinite period at sea. Japan still lies over 8,000 miles away. The lost voyage is about to become a disaster. Columbus's lost voyage has taken his crew away from home for over five months, and still there is no end in sight. The fleet follow the coast, searching for a route to Japan and China. Many of them are starting to believe it doesn't actually exist. Although they don't know it, they have now circumnavigated the entire Central American Rim, an impressive feat, even by today's standards. But still, the westward passage remains elusive. To make matters worse, Columbus has arrived at one of the most inhospitable places on Earth. The east coast of Panama is probably one of the most humid places in Central America. You have places there with 300 days of rainfall. This is like really a swamp, a huge mangrove forest, and it's probably the worst place for a human to be. Even today, the area along this coast, known as the Darien Jungle, remains one of the last impenetrable places on Earth. Everything is wet and soggy and damp. Clothes start rotting in a very short time. Between the rainstorms, the insects come out, the mosquitoes, and of course, the diseases get going. The malaria, the fevers, um, which, which are endemic along that section of coast. Columbus recalled how his crew started to give up hope. The crews were so broken that they prayed for death to give them martyrdom. Tired, hungry, and in despair, the crews are fast losing any remaining respect for Columbus. All because of his stubborn intent to find the westward passage to the Orient. And for the first time, even Columbus himself begins to doubt that he can succeed. He fears that it is only a matter of time before his crew mutiny. 